Hello and welcome to this episode of Human Rights Magazine. My name is Derek McCush. This episode is the third in a series on Syria by Emma Belouni. In this one, she gets insights from several people about the brutality of the Assad regime and the possibilities for holding it accountable for its crimes against humanity. Emma is now also the host of a new podcast series, Où en sont les femmes, in which she explores the situation of women in the world. The series is in French, and, like Human Rights Magazine, is a program of the Upstream Journal. You can find out more at upstreamjournal.org. More than 14,000 people have been tortured to death by the Syrian regime since 2011. 72 methods of torture were used, according to a 2019 report by the Syrian Network for Human Rights. The Assad regime perpetrated countless visible attacks on Syrian civilians, mass bombings, sieges, and the use of chemical weapons. Still, there is another layer of abuse that Assad has been trying to keep hidden and secret. That is mass disappearances, torture, mutilations, and executions. In 2019, German prosecutors accused Anwar Raslan, a defected Syrian colonel, and Eyad al kharib his associate, of complicity in crimes against humanity. Between 2011 and 2012, Raslan directed the notoriously violent Secret Service Unit, Branch 251 in Damascus, where more than 4,000 people were tortured, resulting in the death of dozens. The trial started in April 2020. And in January 2022, Al Gharib was sentenced to four and a half years, while Aslan was convicted to life in prison. The Coblenz trial marks the first step towards justice for Syrian torture survivors, as around 100,000 disappeared Syrians remain unaccounted for. I'm Mazen Darwish, a Syrian lawyer and human rights defender, now a refugee in, in France. Mazen Darwish created the Syrian Center for Media and Free Expression in 2004. It started off as a monitoring center for attacks on journalists and activists in Syria. The center was forced to operate in secret and Darwish was subject to travel bans and had already lost his lawyer license. But he kept going up until February 16, 2012, when the Syrian military raided the center's headquarters and arrested Darwish, as well as other staff members. He was detained and tortured for over a year. And for him, the Coblenz trial is only an alternative solution. This is very slowly, step by step, and uh, this is not the justice. This is not the answer about the crime happened in Syria, but this is a tools, the alternative tools we have, because we can't reach the international justice, the ICC and the veto from Russia. We don't have political transition to speak about transitional justice, and this is not from the past to also speak about dealing with the past while the crime daily happened. My name is Medina Habak. I'm a legal fellow and trial monitor at the Syria Justice and Accountability Center, SJEC. As part of our trial monitoring program, we have monitored the Koblenz trial, the trial against Anwar Raslan and Ayat al Kharib, and are now monitoring the trial against Ala M in Frankfurt, Germany. The Koblenz trial was the first trial that dealt with crimes committed by the Syrian government or affiliates of the Syrian government. In this case, the two defendants in the Koblenz trial, they were both working for the Syrian intelligence, for the General Intelligence Directorate. One of them was the head of the interrogation division at a branch of the Syrian intelligence, the so-called branch 251 in Damascus, and the other defendant was working for a subdivision of the General Intelligence Directorate and was mostly involved in like raids and arresting demonstrators on the street. 
for the public, it's important to have this acknowledgement of what the government was doing. And it's also for other courts and authorities, it's a good but learning experience and a best practice example of what can go wrong and what can be done better. My name is Wolfgang Kalek. I'm the general secretary of the Berlin-based legal human rights organization, European Center for Constitutional and Human Rights, ECCHR in Berlin. In the serial cases, for us, the decisive moment was that even before the summer of migration in 2015, many Syrians exiled to Germany. Many of them have participated in oppositional activities and approached us, told us many stories about the repression of the Assad regime. And in particular, after 2015, 100,000, we, we have now 800,000 Syrians here in Germany, came here. Amongst them, lawyers, journalists, multiplicators, political activists, who all were pleading for accountability. And this is where we saw then that we are needed to support this community. And also, we have to say, it was for us a game changer to work with such a strong exile community in our own country, because normally we work, of course, we work with exiled activists or lawyers, but uh, that was a quantity we haven't had dealt with before. That was very interesting. That was decisive for the cases. But obviously, it was also difficult in many regards. Germany is able to prosecute Syrian nationals on its territory because of the universal jurisdiction principle. The universal jurisdiction is based on the idea that there are certain crimes that are so grave that they affect mankind as such and therefore have to be prosecuted by any state regardless of whether the perpetrator was a national of that state regardless of the crime scene so if that crime occurred on the territory of the prosecuting state or if one of the victims was a citizen of the prosecuting state Ever since 2002, it is possible for German authorities to prosecute these grave crimes, which are basically the core international crimes, the so genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity, and of course the Syrian state itself is not prosecuting these crimes. So there's no other avenue for justice and accountability for Syrians than universal jurisdiction. And these universal jurisdiction prosecutions and trials are really filling the impunity gap when it comes to crimes committed in the Syrian conflict. Obviously, we should at some point talk more about universal jurisdiction in Europe because it's, a, it's an up and down. And that is definitely a problem because in the late 90s and the early 2000s, Belgium and Spain started with a lot of ambitions, with a lot of important investigations and trials. And then they were pushed back and then there was a little bit of silence. Now Germany is very proactive, but it, they should be a more European approach. And this is also what we are aiming for. But in the Syria cases, we have to say that, for example, the arrests, which led then to the Koblenz trials, were carried out in uh, cooperation with France. So there is a lot of European interest, and I see the Koblenz spray cases not as unique, but somehow as pilot cases. And we hope that more will follow because only then it makes sense. After five years, maybe now it's more clear for the Syrian that he can say, I will win, or there is no winner. When we start in 2016, a lot of Syrians, they have uh, this, called that next month when the regime was held down. So why we will go to this uh, type of work? But we have started to present the evidence, and it's clear this is a platform we can present the crime made from the regime. It's not about this two person. 
it's not about a personal revenge, but it's about the mentality and the mythology that the regime uses. And some of the Syrians support this war, some of them not, but also the outreach, uh, it's a question because I don't know if we succeed to reach the majority of the Syrian and the diaspora. You know, it's happened in COVID uh, period, so um, the majority, they cannot be in the trial directly. There is a question of the translation also, and there is a huge problem, or let me say something very sad for us that the court refused recording the trial. So we lose the chance to have a record for the new generation, for the other Syrian to present it to them. I think translation, accessibility, and witness protection were certainly among the most prominent obstacles to this trial, because of course there are certain practical hurdles that arise from the fact that the prosecuting and investigating authorities don't have access to the crime scene and have to rely on documents that were smuggled out of Syria. And then, of course, these witnesses do not speak the language of the prosecuting state, but their mother tongue, Arabic. So that's kind of the, the bundle of practical hurdles that come with these trials. And in Koblenz, translation from German into Arabic was not available for the public audience. My colleague, a trial monitor at SJAC and a Syrian journalist petitioned to the Federal Constitutional Court in Germany to get access to the translation and the Constitutional Court decided that the court in Koblenz must at least make the translation available for accredited Arabic speaking journalists. That's the first step, but in practice, almost no Syrian Arabic speaking Syrian journalists or Arabic speaking journalists came to the trial because it took place during COVID. So international travel was, was difficult. So translation and accessibility was one issue. And the other one, witness protection, that's because of course, German authorities or any authorities of a prosecuting state cannot operate within Syria and not, cannot grant the people living there, families of witnesses, cannot grant them protection and safety. So many witnesses in the Koblenz trial stated that their families were still living in Syria or other countries bordering with Syria, that the witnesses themselves then felt threatened and intimidated, and some of them even then refused to testify in court because they did not feel safe and feared that their identifying information will be accessible to the wrong person. The court then decided that at least it has to do everything to, to protect the witnesses within the court, so they did not have to mention their addresses in court and whenever possible they were anonymized and did not have to provide their names but of course it was not in many cases it was not sufficient for the witnesses and their families to feel entirely safe and comfortable i then asked if the regime had been impacted in any way by the trial first of all what we hear from Syrians in Syria, but also outside of Syria, is that arrest warrants, but also the trial and the judgment were perceived in Syria. So both the former oppositionals, but also the regime took notice of what was going on. We knew that before because we know about threats against witnesses of the Koblenz trial. So the Syrian regime was aware of what was going on. And then there was also the new law introduced by the Assad regime prohibiting torture two months after the Koblenz trial. And I guess they wouldn't have done it without the Koblenz trial. So they are aware that the world is watching them, 
I'm not saying that this has an immediate effect. It has definitely not the effect we would like to like to have it, but it's also clear that they they observe it and that fits into a broader picture that even in cases where it seems that not much is going on because you no know, investigations or no prosecutions are happening, but the community of the perpetrators is very much aware of potential dangerous countries where they shouldn't go, which is obviously not the big win, but it's also not nothing. I think there is many impact. Maybe it's not clear that the reflection or the regime doesn't give a direct reflection. This is one of his strategy. But in general, we believe that there is many way we can see that it's a matter for the regime. By example, uh, anyone the French court uh, released a restaurant against uh, Ali Mamluk and Jamil Hassan and uh, uh, Abdel Salam Mahmoud, they have uh, uh, international TV, they have a program as usual. Mazen Darwish working for Mossad and CIA and uses tools to attack the national resistance. This uh, propaganda, but this is mean that they are care and they recognize it. The verdict of the Cullen's trial did not include any reparations for the victims. The war in Syria is very complicated. There is a civilian uprising against the government, but also there is a civil war. There is ISIS and al Nusra. There is the Turkish army. There is Iran and Hezbollah. Uh, there is many elements in Syria. There is many players. We have also a religious conflict between Sunni and Alawite and the other minority. We have ethnic conflict in Syria also. So when we are speaking about reparation, the, the victim themselves could be the victim for many parties. And the victim themselves, in one period, they could be a victim. In the second period, they could be a criminal. Uh, so. This person whose alien protest in 2011 and arrested and tortured and released, and he joined uh, Al Nusra later or joined Daesh. So, how we can uh, consider the victimizing all this type of question when we are talking about reparation? The majority of the Syrian, both sides, they believe there is one winner. So, the government believe that they will win everything and everything will go like before 2011 and this is will never happen and the opposition side think that it's just a few months and they will destroy the regime and they will take control of all of syria and this is also will never happen so we don't have a winner in syria this is one of the problems but because also now we understand there is no one will win, all of us lose. It's more easy or more practical. We can speak about practical solution, not ethical war. So now I think we start ask our question: What is the meaning of justice? What was the meaning of preparation? What is the meaning of guarantee to not happen again. We then talked about the roles of Western corporations and actors. That's the whole critique of third world approaches towards international law, that the Westerns present themselves as saviors and don't talk about their own role. And in particular, that applies to Western companies. In many war crime scenarios, we have Western arms, we have Western surveillance technology, and that was also the case in Syria. Uh, German-based surveillance technology companies sold their equipment to Syria, and even you know, in the beginning of the of the of the of the civil war, back in 2011 until 2012, they made their businesses. And with five cases, it's good 
that we have a new love for accountability in the Syria cases and now also for Ukraine. But at some point, Western judicial authorities should have an eye on their own crimes, on the participation of their own actors into the crimes of others. So the current practice of double standards should be overcome. We, we need many more steps. We need to have trials in Germany and elsewhere in Europe against all those who are suspicious of crimes against humanity and who are on European territory. That's the first step. The second step is even if they are not present in Europe, for example, like the uh, Secret Service Director of the Air Force, Secret Service Jamil Hassan, there is the possibility of international arrest warrants against absent perpetrators, because that would allow to act when they in future not only enter European soil, but also when they enter countries where Europe has a good legal cooperation with. The third step is obviously it's European authorities, not only German authorities, um, should always bear in mind when they assess the situation in Syria that there is a regime in place which committed and commits crimes against humanity, especially arbitrary detention and torture and, and inhumane treatment. That means that nobody should be extradited or pushed back to Syria. No refugee should be sent back to Syria, but it means also that on the long run, there should be another government in Syria. And we have many good examples of former presidents or former heads of states who were put on trial while nobody thought about it five or 10 years I mean, earlier. So history proves that nobody is safe from prosecution and that should be communicated all over the place. There is a general remark, and that is that law and lawyers won't heal the world. You know, that's a very clear thing. But still, I believe or we believe that law provides a very important standards and also limits. When it comes to limits, that's then the absolute prohibition of torture. And when it comes to criminal trials, what we want to say is that no law cannot anyhow repair crimes against humanity. It's an important reaction to crimes against humanity, but we have to be very much aware of the limits of criminal law. I reiterate it not only in the direction of the general public, but also in the direction of other NGOs who would claim historical judgment, the end of impunity in Syria or International Criminal Court, now the world will be a better place. No, that's not the point. The world um, was always, on one hand, a good place, and for many people also a very bad place to live in. The criminal law approach should only be one amongst many other approaches of societies to deal, to come to terms with crimes against humanity historians, sociologists who try to understand what happened, artists, writers, civil society actors who should deal with the individual but also the collective traumata crimes against humanity are causing. Activism is also only one, one aspect. It's like academic institutions, it's cultural institutions, it's artists, it's activists. It must be a mixture. Not only activists, not only academics, not only judges. Never ever we should allow lawyers and, uh, and courts to present themselves as the only ones who know what happened and how to deal with what happened. Thank you for listening to this episode of Human Rights Magazine. The podcast is brought to you by the Upstream Journal. I invite you to consider supporting the program and the magazine with a contribution through PayPal as you explore other episodes.